Hi, welcome to a signal pad short episode and here I want to show you the upgrade of the PM6608B Fluke frequency counter. Now I did a repair of this in one of my previous episodes and we discovered the problem with the power supply and went through the analysis and repair of that and I also did a calibration of this on camera and if you remember the calibration involved adjusting a varactor which appears in parallel to the crystal that this unit has. Now adjusting the varactor is quite difficult because you have to be careful not to put too much pressure on it. After all it will completely change in capacitance depending on how much mechanical pressure is on it. As a result of that the stability of this is really really poor and quite sensitive to mechanical shock as well. Now aside from that um, I, I didn't have any way of actually putting an oven controlled crystal oscillator module on there because I didn't have a module compatible with this. Of course you can design one and implement in there and in fact this is exactly what's going on. One of my viewers his name is Dan Watson and emailed me and told me if I still had this frequency counter and that he had developed a little module that was compatible with a whole wide wide range of these uh, different types of frequency counters from Fluke and that if I wanted one, and of course I absolutely did and he has his own blog and I will link to his blog so you can take a look and he finally finished it and he sent me one and check it out first of all it looks awesome I love the purple uh, PCBs and look at how nice and clean this design is it's very very simple and straightforward as with any good engineering solution is now the reason he started doing this was because he managed to get a tray or several trays of these CTS oven controlled crystal oscillator modules from eBay for a very good price so he started putting together a little design that could be plugged directly onto this header over here for an oven controlled crystallizer option. Now there were a couple of challenges along the way that he had to solve. First of all, if you remember, uh, this power supply actually has some live um, DC voltages coming out of it and those DC voltages aren't very good because they're only half rectified and then finally rec uh, fully regulated with these uh, external uh, regulators over here that you can see connected to this heatsink. So the 5 volt rail is not present when the unit is turned off and he needed that because this guy is run from 5 volts and you need to apply 5 volt to it continuously even when the unit is off so that the oven can kick on and keep this at a steady temperature. Not only does that improve its age but it also allows it to be up and running at its final stable value is immediately when you want to start using the unit. Any good frequency counter that has an oven control uh, crystal oscillator in it has that option as, as does for example my uh, Agilent one. So he had to find a good way to do that and he's actually using a Recom DC-DC converter over here, this little module over here which converts the whatever voltage is available from the power supply during standby to power this guy on and keep it warm and running. There's also a, a 10 turn pot over here to adjust the voltage responsible for tuning this module. So as a result you can tune it much uh, nicer and much more accurately and it's obviously much uh, less sensitive to mechanical shock as these things are designed quite uh, to be quite a better. In fact this particular uh, OCXO has a 300 part per billion uh, stability over one year period which is quite good and its phase range is quite good and so on and on. And here you go at the very back you can see his information there's Dan Watson and his, and his uh, blog address and the date that this board was manufactured and you can see that on, in his design he had a 24 volt rail available to him and his unit was in standby because this is compatible with if I go on this side it's compatible to the PM66XX series so mine obviously uh, is actually a little bit different and mine does not have a 24 volt rail it has a 12 volt rail but it doesn't matter it still works um, nicely it still has, has, is sufficient to get the DC DC converter to give us a nice stable 5 volt so having said all that uh, there's uh, actually a couple of other information that's really interesting about Dan's website is that he went ahead and he cut one of these open and he shows you a full tear down of what's inside it and he reverse engineered the schematic and he has posted all that information in a couple of his blog posts so definitely go and check it out a lot of cool material to read and a lot to learn from Now I don't want to go over that because obviously he's done all the work so I want you to make sure uh, to go and see it on his website so as far as we're concerned now we want to do a couple of quick measurements to make sure that we're up and running that we can uh, do this replacement so let's go ahead and get started so first thing first I'm going to plug this guy in and make sure that the unit is in standby there we go so now it's turned off so it's basically sitting in standby I want to make sure that I do have my 12 volt rail available to me so I'm using the iPad which is connected to the National Instrument Virtual Bench and you can see the remote connection directly to it so let's go ahead and see what voltage we have available I'm going to try and not block the screen remember that the voltage is shown 
all the way over at the bottom. I hope that you can read that uh, from the camera. I certainly can't from the LCD screen here. So let's see if we have our 12 volt available in one of these pins. I think it's this one. There you go, there it is. So you can see it says 11.994 volts. So we do in fact have a live uh, 12 volt even when the unit is in standby, which is perfect because that's what we need. Now, when I turn it on, I should be able to measure the 10 megahertz reference that's already there and then I have to find a way to disable that. So let's go ahead and turn the unit on. Let's get this guy, put it over here onto our ground and let's see if we can pick up the 10 megahertz reference. There it is. Whoa, it's enormous. Hold on, let me get these cables out of the way. The camera is right here in front of me, so I really do need more than two hands here. Here we go. Let's change the scale here. Come on, one more time. There it is. So you can see that we have a nice sinusoid that's uh, generated and filtered by the crystal directly, and it's a 9.3 volt peak to peak 10 megahertz. So that signal is definitely there. Now there's also two jumpers here and these jumpers are actually responsible for disabling this crystal. So let's go ahead and, and try and do that and see if we can get rid of that signal completely. So I'm going to put it in standby again. I'm going to change to get rid of both of these guys and move them over by one like so. There we go. Nice. And now we should be able to do this measurement one more time and we should see nothing this time when I power it on. There we go. And there you go. There's now nothing on the crystal pin which means it's now disabled and the path is now selected with the module that's not present. Interestingly enough the unit actually doesn't boot anymore because it doesn't have any clock because that clock, that 10 meg is used as the clock for the whole processor so it's completely uh, not available and it doesn't boot anymore so let's go ahead and put Dan's module in there just to show you how much detail Dan has thought about when he's putting this together he even supplies the little screws that are required to put this into a unit very nice and here we are all nicely installed in there. Let's check it out to see if in standby we do in fact have uh, the 5 volt required to run the oven. And uh, let's see. There we go. And nice, 5.098 volts and we have indeed 5 volt present, which means now the oven should be running and this thing should start to get warm. So let's give it a few minutes and see how warm it gets. All right, I've let this guy warm up for a bit. So let's take a quick temperature measurement here and see if we can capture that temperature and it looks good Let me just make sure we're in focus we're looking at about 50 degrees celsius which is exactly what we should get uh, for it and remember that I'm measuring a temperature from the surface where there is a piece of tape you cannot measure it from the reflective part you're not measuring the temperature of that case anymore that's why we can see this weird variation in temperature on the metallic uh, reflective part but anyway the temperature is about 50 degrees celsius and it's been 50 degrees celsius for quite some time so it has now stabilized now it's time for us to do another calibration and make sure that this is tuned and then we'll be done and here we are, I calibrated it again and check out how nice and stable it is, it's quite amazing. It significant improvement obviously over the old one and I'm very happy with it, it's now calibrated back to my aerobidium standard, so pretty, pretty awesome. And you can see that last digit still is drifting just ever so slightly it's because I unplugged it for about a minute or two while I was moving things around so I can adjust it again to make sure it's up. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed another short episode. The next one is going to be a regular episode. I have a, uh, a nice oscilloscope that I'm going to repair and then a bunch of reviews. So until next time.